Amen. Well, um, a couple, uh, no, not a couple of things, but we've been looking at this, this jigsaw puzzle piece here for the last few weeks, because the title of uh, my series of messages this month is The Missing Piece. We, we, have, we have missing pieces in our hearts and in our lives. Everybody wants to be able to finish the sentence, I am, and then you, and, and then you, want, to be able to, you want to be able to answer that question. You don't want to walk up, somebody walk up and go, who are you? I, I don't know. And you, don't, you don't want to say that. That, that. that seems a bit, you know, like, well, why don't you know? I ain't figured it out yet. Um, and Okay. But, uh, but we want to be able to say it. So oftentimes under pressure we'll say, well, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a wife, I'm a student, I'm a cook, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a carpenter. I'm a, I'm, you know, we, we come up with all of our titles, the hats that we wear, and we use those hats to define who we are. But the reality is, is that it doesn't really define us, does it? We, we, it really doesn't. It just kind of tells us our job description, but it never really speaks to us who we are. Then to complicate things, we look at other people and think, oh, they have it all together. Look at their life, how perfect it is. Look how, how great. They, they got the house I want, the car I want, they got the life I want, they got the family I want, they got everything. And what you don't realize is, is that they're only letting you see the part of their life, of the jigsaw puzzle, that's complete. They're hiding the rest of it, the missing pieces in their life, so that you don't know that they've got the same issues you have. Now, I shared this verse last week uh, in 1 John 1, 7, but if we are living in the light as God is the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And, and one of the things about being a part of fa a family of faith, a community of faith, is that we live in a light that we share each other's hopes and dreams and struggles and weaknesses and, and pains and, and suffer and all the rest of these things. We, in other words, we let people see our whole life, even the gaps, the missing pieces that we may, may be struggling with, that we may be trying to figure out. And you think, well, that people, what are people going to think whenever they look at your life and, and say, well, you, you know, you got some things missing out of, out of, out of your life. Well, if they're going to be that kind of judgmental, I, I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count their opinion as being worthy. If people are just going to point their finger at you and say, see, you're missing this, see, you're missing that, I want to surround myself with people that would say, hey, I notice this is missing in your life, what can I do to help you? What can I do to encourage you? And that's what a community of faith does, is that whenever we go through life and we, we struggle with missing uh, pieces of our heart and of our life, that we have surrounded ourselves with people, but as long as we live in the light, see, if we hide our hearts from each other, we only hurt ourselves. If we hide our hearts from each other, we only hurt ourselves. And in fear of rejection, we separate ourselves from the light of God's healing presence. And I'm not just talking about with us personally, vertically, but God is going to move in your life to bring healing into your life through the people that he has put in your life because he has equipped them with gifts in order to be able to change the direction of your life, your hope, your marriage, your, your physical being, your, your, your everything. And that's what it means to be a part. So one of the things that we often see today is people who are just missing these pieces, but they don't surround themselves with a community of people who will accept them as they are, just as they are with missing pieces. Sometimes, you know, people will even get a little judgmental about their, you know, what their jigsaw puzzle looks like. You know, you've, you've seen, probably the worst jigsaw puzzle I ever saw was, it was all white. It was a thousand pieces and every piece was exactly the same. All, you know, I'm like, this is the, the worst nightmare uh, that, that you could ever say. Then, then on top of that, when I say the same, they're all the same color, but every piece was different. So it wasn't like you could just go through and put all the pieces together easily. No, 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 no. You had to sit there, and there was no picture for you to work with. And, and you know, that, I just, no. I just said, no, I'm not doing it. They're, they're, forget it. I've got better things to do with my time than, than to scream at this thing uh, and, and, and to be able to do it. But we look at people's lives sometimes, and we think that. We look like, you're just a mess. I don't want to mess with you. But in a community of faith, we accept one another with our missing pieces. 
And we praise God for what he has put in our lives and what he has blessed each and every one of us with. Because God has given you something that will make a difference. But it's got to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Last Sunday night, to for example, fry, uh, was fire night. And it was awesome. It was off the hook. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, it was a really, really great service. People were healed. Lives were changed. And, and we were here to share life together, to give and to receive and to depend upon each other. We had a wonderful meal together. It was awesome what was happening, and it was just people coming together to worship God. Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. It's just that stuff. That's all we were doing, and God blessed that. And I thank God for the opportunity for him to be able to do that in our lives. One, one of the odd things in our first message that I talked about was I used the rich young ruler as, a, as an example of somebody who, who really just didn't, um, he didn't get it. So he goes to Jesus to ask a question. I'm not getting it, so, you know, help me get it. And, uh, and the response was, well, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, then come and follow me. And I know a lot of people have really been hard on Jesus. It's like, you really asked a lot of him. Jesus knew what he was about to give, not too long in, in, in a few months after that, after that encounter. So for him to ask for that little bit compared to the life he gave to us on, his, on the cross wasn't a big stretch for Jesus. Somebody say amen, yeah. Whatever he's asking of you, he always has always given more. And so the, the rich young ruler had created a whole world where he felt safe with the very people that he wouldn't love. Think about that for a second. He created a whole world where he felt safe with the very people that he wouldn't love. He was a ruler of people and he was rich. Where to get the money? From the people. And so using them in order to make himself feel better he was just receiving, but he was never giving back. And I've, I asked myself the question, can we do the same thing? Can we be a people that all we do is say, gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy, okay? I just want, gimme more, gimme more, I just need this, I just need this, and, and we never give back of ourselves, of our lives, to be able to not only just, you know, of, you know people is you know, giving any offering, great, that's wonderful, what of your time? What if, what if your presence, what if you personally, that makes all the difference in the world? Did you know that people are happier when they see each other? That's, that's, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a thing in psychology. That's a scientific fact. When we see one another, we feel better. When we met, we, we, he said, how do you know this? It's a real simple test. You ever looked at somebody and say, hey, I missed you. I, I was looking for you. I missed you. See? You do miss people. No, so understand, we miss you too. And we, to be a part of what God is doing requires us together. Amen? Now, I read a book this week. I'm always reading. People who know me know us. I'm, I'm always reading. And there was a question in there that the, that the author proposed, who is a pastor. He's long since passed, but uh, passed away. But he asked this question, and, and I, I was sitting there, and I was thinking, um, that, you know, people are bored with sermons. I was like, yeah, you probably sat through a couple of mine. But uh, uh, I get that. Hey, I've been doing this since I was 16 years old. They all, all of them haven't been a hit. And if you say amen, any one of you who's, no, 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 that's not fair. So uh, you, you, you come in, and, and I've been there. I've done that. You're thinking, man, I've heard this sermon. I've heard that sermon. We're there. We're going to do this again. Da, 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 da. And we're always asking, what's next? Why am I here? Why am I listening to this? Da, 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 da. And, I, you know, and I know nobody actually sits in one of these chairs in here and does this to me. But I can see it in your eyes. Um, you know, there's no secrets. Uh, but we, we, we have to ask ourselves the question, Really, why am I here? What am I doing? What am I doing? Am I here just to receive or am I here to give? And I know some people would say, well, Lord, I'm here to, to receive what God has in store for me, to let him bless my life, to let him speak into my life, to, to rejoice that I am a child of God. And, and praise God, somebody say amen, right? But here's the question I want to ask you is, and there's more to the answer. Oftentimes we stop there. And God says, 
but there's more that I would like to bless you with. There's a missing piece. Let me help you with three things that's going to help you understand what that missing piece is. Number one, what has God called you to do? You can go to version. You can see my notes there if you want to, if you're already a friend with us. And if you're not a friend with us, go find Faith Family Worship Center, Palm City. Ask for friendship. I'll be happy to add you to the list. What has God called you to do? What has God called you to do? Now, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, we know there from what God said through the prophet Jeremiah that God created us before we were born with a purpose and he understood exactly why we would be walking upon this earth breathing perfectly good air. He knew it. He knew it before we even entered into this world. He knew what our purpose was supposed to be. Now in Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Now, right there, I want you to look at, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus. It isn't just we turned over a leaf. It isn't that we just got, you know, uh, overhaul. We, no, we are a new creature in Christ. The, the, the important words there are in Christ. When we allow Christ to come into our lives, he begins to do something different, something new, something that we've never experienced before. I know there are a lot of people that are looking into this world trying to search for and find their purpose. I've met lots of parents who says, I'm sending my kids off to college or to university and I hope they figure it out. That's not a good plan, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't do that one. Uh, uh, Some people take time off to find themselves. Okay, I mean, sometimes that pays off. But we, we do what everybody else does, hoping that they're getting it right. That's what I find most people doing. We just do what everybody else does, hoping they're getting it right. And if they're not getting it right, we're all in the same boat. Well, at least we're all in the same boat together. I never liked that philosophy, I'll be honest with you. Some people will say, well, pastor, we're all in the same boat. Well, somebody give me a life jacket because I don't like this boat. I'm getting off this boat. We got to go find another boat. We got to do, no, this is not good. Yes, some of you are thinking the same thing, but you won't say amen. We build our purpose around family. We build it around careers. We build it around something that we're obsessed about and we pour everything into it. And the reality is all of them can destroy you. And let me share with you why. Because your purpose isn't to create yourself. Let me say it again. Your purpose isn't to create yourself. Your purpose is to get to know the one who created you. The one who, back in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse number 5 said, I know who you're supposed to be. If he already knows who you're supposed to be, doesn't it make sense that you would go and ask him? I, I'm, I, I know that was such deep theology. I mean, I really, I really took you on the deep end on that one. I, I get that. No, let me try it again. If, if the one who created you, the creator of the heavens and the universe, God Almighty, Father in heaven, knows and knew who you were going to be before you were even born, then why are you trying to find yourself when all you need to do is just ask him? That's it. Your purpose is connected to your calling, and everybody has a calling. Everybody has a calling. We're all called. First, you say, well, how how do you know? Well, first of all, there's the Bible. Uh, The Bible says you have a calling. And we look to Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, and it tells all of us to reach our world. You reach your world, okay? Okay. Now, what is your world? Well, on, like on Wednesday night, we were going over Acts 2, 42 through 47. And, and do you know what we found? It was really a good lesson, really one of the better ones we've had in a while. It, it, was, it was something that we found in that that was just absolutely amazing, that everything they did was experienced out there in the world. There, there was no sanctuaries. There were no churches in Acts chapter 2. They hadn't, hadn't developed that far, so everything happened in the street, in the marketplace, in the home, and at the temple. And the temple was open air for everybody to be able to go in and, 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 uh, and, and learn from the apostles and the teaching and everything else. Everything was out in the open for everybody to experience 
everything that God was doing. What was God doing? They were praying for people and they were being healed. The apostles were teaching and people were listening. And there, and there were people, it says in, in the last verse 47, and daily people were being saved. And the reason they were being saved is they, they looked and saw what was going on and said, I want that. When we take what is in here and we take it out there, I guarantee people are going to say, I want that. And that's the call of the church today. What did they experience? Matthew 22, 37 through 40, it's called the, the great commandment. They experienced people loving God and each other. That's it. That's all the people were doing. They were loving God and each other. Go look at it. Acts 2, 42 through 47. And tell me if that's not what's there. They were worshiping and praying and they were loving one another. They were feeding one another, taking care of each other. They were sharing each other, making sure everybody, and if there was a missing piece, somebody was there to help with the missing pieces. They were called to do that. Now, the second thing you can do is you can also listen to the voice of God. Yes, you can hear God's voice. Do not panic. You're not hearing voices in your head. No, 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 no. They got medication for that. Don't do that. Okay. But God speaks to us in a still small voice, the scripture says. And God calls people to specific people, tribes, nations, needs, times, places. God can call you to be able to do it. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter what you've done. God can call you. And while you can do everything that you can do with all the talent that you have and all the gifts that you have and all the intelligence that you can muster up, you have to remember this. You have to remember this right here. God can use them, but he's never limited by them. You think God is limited with only what you can do. You don't get it. God created you to experience more than what you have at your hand. God will always do more through you than what you can offer. Always. But if we run from his calling on our lives, we're just running from his presence. Let me say it again. If you're running from the calling on your life, you're running from his presence. Paul is on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter number 9. Most of us know the story fairly well, but just to hit the highlights, God comes, there's a divine light from heaven, Jesus speaks to him. Why are you giving me such a hard time, Paul? Paul was the number one Christian hater in the world. I mean, he is absolutely the worst guy who's, who you would recruit to become the number one Christ promoter in the world. If you're looking at that, you're going to go, this is not the guy I would pick. No, this, this isn't where I would be going. But just exactly what happened was the worst choice became the best choice. The worst choice became the best choice. I got one amen out of that. Okay, let me help you connect the dots here because you're not connecting the dots, Okay. You think you're the worst choice. You think you're not qualified. You think you're not good enough. You don't get it. If Paul, right, can, can be the guy who literally murdered Christians for their faith in Christ, become the number one evangelist in the world, the reason why the church even exists today, and write two-thirds of the New Testament... You're qualified. You're qualified to be able to change the world around you. We put too much pressure on ourselves because we need to measure up. We always think we need to measure up. And, and improving yourself and, and growing, and yeah, I get that. And we should. I mean, you just, you, you know that, I know that. But he does not purpose you for what you can do in the natural because what you can do in the natural honestly is too small. God purposes you to do something in the supernatural that is bigger than you. And that, when that happens, you know who gets the credit and the glory and the honor and the worship? He does. When we do it on ourselves, we get all the credit. We don't want all the credit. 
We want God to move in and through our lives so he gets all the credit. Amen. Number two, stop living somebody else's dream. Stop living somebody else's dream. Peter and Paul are two completely different people. Okay? We see this in Galatians. Paul writes, in fact, James, Peter, and John who were known as pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me. They accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued to work with the Jews. Now, here's the deal. James, Peter, John, they're out there. They're reaching their people. They're reaching their world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the other most part of the earth. They're reaching. they're, They're doing it. Paul is not called necessarily to reach those people. But we see in Acts 9, he says, I want you to go out and reach the Gentiles, the very people that as a Jew, he thought were nothing better than dogs. Also, I I want to point out that Peter was the one who in Acts chapter number 10 was used of God in order to be able to bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles in the house of Cornelius, and as a result of that, the Gentiles became a part of the church of Jesus Christ. You see, if Peter and, and, and Paul were arguing, if they were spending their time arguing with each other all the time, nothing would have ever been accomplished. Because Paul would have been obsessed with what Peter's doing, and Peter would have been obsessed with what Paul was doing, and, and, and that would have been the end of it. Nothing would have ever come of it. And the same is true when we compare ourselves to to others. Personally, in our marriage, in our ministry, whatever the case is. If you're comparing yourself to somebody else, you never measure up. And you occupy and become obsessed with trying to conquer or win over or, or be better than, or be smarter than, or get a better credential, or get whatever the case is. You, you're, you're obsessed with all those things in order to try to, to win. And the reality is you lose because you're not doing what God called you to do. Envy or the strong desire to have what either other people have. There's a word for it in the Bible called covetousness. Nobody really knows that, but it means to have a strong desire to have what other people got. So you see somebody else got that bass boat, you want to go get the bass boat, okay? That, that illustration worked better in Okeechobee when I preached over there. Uh, whenever, you, whenever you, <laughs> when you see your neighbor's Mustang, you want a Mustang. That one worked better. Okay, so the, uh, uh, we, we see that God wants us to pay attention to him, but when we become more obsessed about what is going on around us, we're allowing the world, and we're allowing Satan to distract us. Look what this person's doing over here. Look what this person's doing over there. You don't measure up like you should. You should have done better than that. You're better than this. You couldn't, and we're sitting around and we're just looking at all the things that are happening all around us. All the while, we're not living out the purpose of our life and we feel empty. We have a missing piece. In our hearts, listen to the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 17 and 18. If the whole world were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? Our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. That is what what Paul is doing there. He's saying every one of you serve in the body of Christ. All of you serve in a different place. The Holy Spirit has empowered you. So, first of all, you're not a mistake. You're not a mistake. Oh, yeah, mom and dad might have got surprised when you showed up. But that doesn't mean that you were a mistake. Jeremiah 1.5 says, I knew you before you knew they knew you were showing up, and I knew what was going to be happening in your life before you arrived. God created you for a reason. You are here for a purpose. You have a calling that God is placing upon your life. And he is looking at your life and saying, this is good. Well, I'm really kind of having to plow through that one. All right, let let me back up just a second for you. Because a lot of us look in a mirror and we say, well, this is not good. 
And God looks at you and goes, no, that's good. So who's right? Well, it's easy to say God in here, but whenever you leave here and you look in the mirror tomorrow morning, what are you going to say? Oh, God, yes, that's exactly what you're going to say. That's a good remark. The, uh, uh, with, with that, you have to believe out there what you believe in here. Or otherwise, both have no value, neither have any value. You can't say one thing in here and then live a different life out there. And you say, now, out there, obviously, you you know, that's not going to do anything. But it just robs you of your purpose in the house of God. Stop telling God that he messed up. But I'm not perfect. I don't get this right. He hasn't done with you yet. Hello? Hello? He's not done with you yet. But I should be this and I should be that. Patience. Hang in there. God's working with you. Don't quit. Don't give up. You may see a picture of who you are supposed to be. Don't assume that because you are not living up to that expectation that God thinks you're a failure. He's like, no, I want you to know where you're going, and I'm going to get you there. If we put our hearts into that truth instead of the distractions of this world, we will know more about ourselves than we could ever imagine. And you know what? You will find out things about yourself that you'll actually like. Uh. You will. Number three, your purpose cannot be realized on your own. Your purpose cannot be realized on your own. Hey, you need help. And this, is, this becomes a silo buster. This becomes a deal breaker right here. Whenever whenever you do this. So remember, we we like to create silos around ourselves because we feel safe in there. You know, we 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 control who comes in, who goes out, what happens in here, what's going on, and then life comes along and then our silos get you know disappear like a tornado in Kansas and uh, and everything comes comes flying apart and we're not safe anymore. But whenever you experience with the Holy Spirit you discover that it's based upon his will, not your will. Your experience with the Holy Spirit is based upon his will, not yours. Now, be excited about his, work, his works and gifts in your life. If, first thing right up. If God says, hey, listen, I want you to preach, I want you to teach, I want you to help, I want you to uh, uh, pray for, uh, for healing for others, I want you to speak in wisdom to others, whatever it is, be excited about that. Don't look at that and go, oh no, what if I mess up? Again, God is not done with you yet. Again, God's looking upon you and say, this is good. Again, the gift giver knows what he's doing Trust him, what he's doing. Well, God, you, can, you couldn't have done that to me. You couldn't be calling me to do this. There's no way that this would be possible. Yes, it is possible because he said so. And you, and you can't reverse that decision. Jonah 1.3. Oh, you're going to love me for this one. You see Jonah running away from God. He's not running away from God's will. He knows what God's will is. God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach the gospel. He hates the Ninevites. Oh, hates them, loathes them. He says, I'm not doing it. So he gets on a boat and he goes in the opposite direction. Long story there, fish, yeah, it's ugly. Anyhow, here's the deal. He wasn't running away from God's will. He was running away from his presence. And a lot of times people, they say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. You're not running away from his will. You're running away from his presence. And then you wonder why you're living in a Sahara desert of spiritual life. Don't be Jonah. That was real easy. I mean, uh, anybody could get that one. Don't be Jonah. Live in his presence. 
The whole book of 1 Corinthians is dedicated to sending a very clear message to every one of us here today that every believer should be experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in their life, the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the presence of God. It's not the, not the kind of holy aura of God. It is the third member of the Trinity. He is God and is sent to be here and to be with us even today, every day, to guide us, lead us, direct us, empower us, and teach us to make us to be more, to teach us to change, to be more like Jesus and to help us to be able to rely upon him more. The Holy Spirit isn't a mystical beating. It's God working in your life to lead you to a life in Christ, in Christ alone. In, verse, in Luke 10, we see Jesus sending out the, the 72 in verses 8 and 9. If you enter a town and, he, and, you come, and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you, heal the sick, tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. Expect gifts to confirm the message. Expect gifts to confirm the message. A lot of people say, well, I don't see miracles happen. Have you been giving them the message that Jesus saves and that Jesus gives hope and life and will turn your life around and give you a future? Do not accept the burden of the task without the gifts of the Spirit or you end up trying to fulfill his purpose with your own power. If I, if I could give you a list of people that I know have tried to do that for decades. God called them. This is what I'm going to go do. And they just took off. And God's going, wait, wait, wait. Get back here. That's wrong direction. Get over here. What happened? They failed. Many times when we try to do God's purpose in our life without the Holy Spirit empowering us, we fail. Because we can't do it on. God's going to give us and you such a dream that is so large that, that only he can fulfill it. If we could do it on our own, we would be getting projects that we could fulfill on our own, that we can do under our own power. But that's no. We're always reaching beyond what we can do to see what God will do. Ephesians 4, 8 says, that is why scripture says, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. When we are in his presence, he pours out his gifts upon us. Now, get this, because we're getting, getting closer here. We want the gifts in our life, and everybody said, amen. yeah, amen, we want those gifts. But as we grow, being in his presence is more important than his gifts. Being closer to Christ matters more because we realize the gifts are just the gifts. He can give them to us whenever we need them. They're just there. That's not the pinnacle of our relationship with Jesus Christ. The pinnacle is being in his presence and knowing him. We don't focus on the gifts. We focus on the gift giver. He's the one. And he wants us to decide, desire him more and more so that he can give those things to us. Your calling doesn't come, you know, you didn't, you, yeah, you might have a moment. I just started to say that, but yeah, you could might, you might have a moment where you like Eli um, in the book of 1 Samuel, Samuel and Eli, and he's, Samuel's a little boy, and, and Samuel's just asleep, and, and he hears Samuel, and he thinks Eli's calling him. He gets up, and he goes see the high priest Eli, and I didn't call you. After the third time, Eli wises up what's going on. He says, God's calling you. Talk to him. So the next time, whenever Samuel hears his name, he gets up and he says, yes, Lord. And God speaks to him, even as a boy. And he becomes the judge and prophet of Israel that God called him to be. That's when it happened. Sure, you could have those moments whenever he speaks to you that way. But it's our desire to be in his presence where we learn and see that more. And all of a sudden, he'll speak something into your heart and you go, I get it. Those girls need me. Those guys need me. That country needs me. My coworkers need me. My family needs me. All of a sudden, these people will pop up in front of you and you're going, 
oh, 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 there they are. You're calling me to them. That's who you're calling me to. Our calling is always to go to be the people. How many of you know that? Amen? It's always. It's always about people. You know why? Because God loves people. I don't find anywhere in the Bible that he loves buildings or he loves dirt or he loves organizations or he loves denominations or he loves any of the rest of that stuff. We see its existence and he acknowledges it, but he loves people. Jesus died on a cross for people. He rose from a grave for people to give us hope. And the greatest purpose is to get to know and walk with him in every day of our life and to pour that out upon us. Did you know that you cannot introduce somebody to somebody else if you don't know them? Could you walk up to a random stranger in Walmart or Publix or somewhere and just find two random strangers and introduce them to each other? No, you don't even know their names. How can we introduce Jesus to people when we don't know Jesus? We must be in his presence, and in his presence we are able to introduce the one we know to the people who need to know him. And that makes all the difference in the world to each and every one of us. That he pours out his spirit upon us, and he changes our lives. I apologize for the water, but pollen is still pollen. Mm. Oh, I love this time of the year. Spring starts tomorrow. So, somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, okay, good. Question for you. Are you focused on knowing him, or are you focusing on what you can accomplish I saw this video this morning. My wife sent it to me. And, and, and a study was done of people who read the Bible. And, and these people who read the Bible, it's, it, there was a study of many, all, all sorts of ages and people, and it was done over a longer period of time. The people who read the Bible once a week, eh, you know, that really didn't have any kind of impact on their life. And, and people who read the Bible twice a week, well, it, it was a little better, but negligible. You know, a little movement, but yeah. And people who read the Bible three times a week, okay, that was a little better. I mean, you can see a little, you know, a little movement of things going on in their life. But when it went to four times a week, all of a sudden, everything went through the roof. And the people who read the Bible four times a week, all of a sudden had better peace about the world they live in. Their relationships were stronger and better. Their, their understanding of their world was complete. They weren't terrified of what was going on around them. I mean, there was just this long list of things that all of a sudden, four times a week, it went from three to four, you could just see it, just, just right there, and, and, and it came out there. And, I, and I'm and, and they just kind of left the article right there at that particular point. You know, the guy who's doing a video is like, you know, you should read the Bible at least four times or more a week. That was his point. I get that. But I understood it because of what I was going to say here today was is that whenever you're in his word, the more you're in it, the more you're in his presence. And in his presence is where your life changes. Church helps. Being in a small groups help. But be in his presence. So my question being is, are you focusing on knowing him or are you focusing on what you can accomplish? And if you're focusing more on the accomplishment than knowing him, you're a very frustrated person. And you're very frustrated with God. And you're very frustrated with the people who work for him like me and everything that's happening. We, we must focus on what he is doing in our hearts and lives in this moment. Who has God called you to reach? What has God called you to do? What is your calling? And if that is the missing piece that is in your heart and life, then I know a God who wants to answer the question. He's like, I've, got, I've been holding this for you. Let me put this in your puzzle. 
Let me place this in your life. Let me show you what it is that I have in store for you because I know this. I've known this since you were born. I've known this before you were born. I knew this from the very foundations of the earth. I knew what I had created you for. And it brings him joy when we ask the question, Lord, what have you called me to do? Stand with me if you would, please. And for those of you online hanging there, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. We come together, we worship him, well, everything that we say, everything that we do. But here it is. Here's where it comes. I know that everybody here struggles with something. I struggle with stuff. My wife, Betty, struggles with stuff. We, everybody struggles with something. And we, we get to that point of that struggle that's happening in our hearts and lives. We get very frustrated and we just kind of throw up our hands and quit and just say, whatever. I don't know. I quit. I can't do this. I'm done. And we get stuck in that moment. We're stuck in that moment. And there, there are billions of people on this planet that are stuck in a moment. They're stuck in a thought. They're stuck in a phrase. Something that they have heard or said over their lives and they come to that place and they're just, that, that's it, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And, and what, I, what I want you to know today is that those words are not the last words that are supposed to be spoken over your life. I've, I've worked with people who have had physical challenges and emotional challenges and mental challenges who knew God's will for their life and served him with purpose and joy. Well, you know, whenever this happens and that happens, I'll be able to do this and then I can do that. It never happens. And if it does, guess what doesn't happen? We, we wait until the perfect moment. We wait until this is solved. We, we hesitate because, and we create all these excuses and all of them accomplish one thing and one thing only. They steal your peace of mind and heart to do what God called you to do. We are called to reach our world one person at a time to help lead people to discover their new life in Christ. In Christ. This world offers new life in so many other names. All of them are fake and failures. Only Christ. And so, who is God calling you to? Who is Christ speaking into your heart and life and saying, here, this is what I created you for? So, Father, I pray that we will ask in the name of Jesus with all of our heart and soul and spirit, with all of our mind and being and body, why am I here? What are you calling me to do? Today, what is it? Who am I reaching for you? Whose lives are you putting in front of me to introduce you to? What gifts have you empowered me to use to bless them with? Who can I pray for? Who can I believe for? Whose lives will be changed because of what you're doing in and through me? And it's not about me, Jesus. It's about you. to be in your presence and to be more like you. Take a moment for everyone here and online just to say, Lord, I just want to be in your presence and let your presence change me. Create me, help me be the person you created me to be. I'm not just wearing a hat. I'm looking for a calling. 
I don't need a hat for people to know who I am in Christ. Father, I thank you for what you're going to do in these hearts and lives right now in the name of Jesus. Speak to them. Speak to the people online. Speak to everyone who watches on YouTube. Speak to them and let them know you love them. You created them. They are wonderfully made and you have a purpose for their life to your glory and honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Somebody give thanks and glory to God in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. How many of you want a blessing? Amen. All right, say it with me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless.